wise man once said, what we need is a new myth. What we need is a new true story that tells us where we're going in the universe. One of the things that I like to use in general conversation, just as a, a, a gauge to see whether or not the person I'm speaking with is open to philosophic ideas and whether or not they're willing to take an extreme idea and either just listen to it or if they're going to just shut down. And the simulation theory is perfect for that. Now, the simulation theory is a real theory and it's gaining a lot of traction lately. It's a really interesting theory and I like to work with it in a philosophic sense. I think here's in my mind, like the, the, the strongest argument for, the, for us being in a simulation, probably being in a simulation, I think is the following. Um, that that 40, called 40, 40 years ago, we had Pong, like two rectangles and a dot. That right. was what games were. Um, now, 40 years later, we have photorealistic 3D simulations with millions of people playing simultaneously, and it's getting better every year. And soon we'll have virtu you know, vir virtual reality, of augmented reality. Um, if you assume any rate of improvement at all, um, then the games will become indistinguishable from reality. Just in, indistinguishable. Um, e even if that rate of advancement drops by a thousand from what it is right now, um, then you just say, okay, well, well let's imagine it's 10,000 years in the future, uh, which is nothing in the evolutionary scale. Um, so, um, so, so given that we're clearly on a trajectory to have games that are indistinguishable from reality, and those games could be played on any set-top box or on a PC or whatever, and there would probably be, you know, billions of such, uh, you know, computers or set-top boxes, it would seem to follow that the odds that we're in base reality is one in billions. So Tell me what's wrong with that argument. Is the answer yes? <laughs> the argument is probably. I mean, I just like, is there is there a flaw in that argument? I mean, someone, but someone. I'm not that, sure what but, the error. In, all right, no, no, the argument makes sense. So the assumption then is that somebody beat us to it, and this is a game. No, no, there's a one in billions chance that this is base reality. Oh, okay. What do you think? Well, I think it's one in billions. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, this, this that seems to be. Like clearly, what the you know what the, what it, what it suggests, right. and and actually, I mean, arguably, we should hope that that's true, because otherwise, if if civilization stops advancing, then that may be due to some calamitous event that erases civilization. So maybe we should be hopeful that this is a simulation, because otherwise, because they could reboot it. Well, otherwise. Either we're going to create simulations that are indistinguishable from reality or civilization will cease to exist. Those are the two options. So I like to take this theory and say, well, okay, let's say that we are living in a simulation, that we are playing some sort of a computer game. Let's look for some virtual Easter eggs. You know, if you're watching a movie or you're reading a book, you are entering into this unspoken agreement between you and the author that you're going to suspend your disbelief. And I like to ask my audience to suspend their belief. I like to suggest that we hit the pause button on this game of life and analyze some of the things that we believe. Truth is our only compass and it can lead you down a rough road. How does that saying go? The truth will set you free, but first it's gonna really piss you off. Ignorance is bliss. And this is a cliche for a reason. Ignorance is the easy way. To live in a world without becoming aware of the meaning of the world is like wandering about in a great library without touching the books. You know, those who live their life this way fall prey to the following. There are two ways to be fooled. One is to believe what isn't true, and the other is to refuse to believe what is true. However, if the truth can be told so as to be understood, it will be believed. Nevertheless, sometimes people don't want to hear the truth because they don't want their illusions destroyed. And some will accuse me of blasphemy. I'm going to talk quite a bit about John Allegro in just a little bit.
he's a prime example of shooting the messenger. After years of searching for religious truth, I've come to the understanding that it no longer matters to me if a man named Jesus ever rose from the dead or was ever born of a virgin. I find more meaning buried within the legend than I ever would if the story were factual. And one of the things that really pulled me out of the Christian cycle and let me see myself in this bigger picture was when I got curious about Easter. I was wanting to know when my cousins were coming to town because they came from St. Louis to visit every year for Easter. So when is Easter this year, I would ask. And no one knew, even the pastor in the church didn't know. We do a countdown to celebrate some holidays at the very moment that they occur. And what I learned was, we do this for Easter as well. Easter is the most important holiday of the whole church. And for believers that go to church every Sunday to not know when Easter is, or how to know when Easter is, is a shame, really. But knowing how to uh, calculate the Easter date is something that can uh, turn your mind in the direction of asking questions. Without the resurrection, Jesus would be a hierophant, a philosopher. So how do we calculate Easter? Well, the first thing we do is we wait until the days and the nights are both equal lengths of time, the spring equinox. So after New Year's, we wait, spring equinox comes, we start to pay attention, okay? Because now we're gonna wait until the first full moon after the spring equinox. At this moment, the, the moon and the earth both have equal amounts of light, both have equal amounts of dark. Now we're really paying attention because we're gonna wait until sunrise on Sunday. And that's the moment, that's the sacred moment when everything is in balance. Dawn is the time that stands between darkness and light. Dawn marks the sunrise. This is the tipping of the scale of balance between dark to light, when darkness becomes light. So at dawn, exactly at dawn, here we have Easter sunrise service. Right there at this moment before dawn, we are in darkness. When the sun cracks the horizon, that moment is the balance that we've been waiting for. That's why we're in church at that time. And then we start singing our songs of joy and praise after the sun has come up during these sunrise services because we've tipped the balance and now we're experiencing light. No longer are we engulfed in this darkness of wintertime. This is the ritual and this is the philosophy. And these are the little Easter eggs that I'm talking about that have been right in front of us all along ever since we were little kids. And all you have to do is watch the sky and you can start to put these things together. So like I said, you know, it doesn't really matter to me if you know, a man named Jesus ever floated up into the heavens on the wings of angels. I find more meaning buried behind the legend than I ever would find if the legend were an actual true story. Because there's a lot more to Easter than just an Easter sunrise service on one side and the legend on the other. Where did the legend come from? How did this come to be? The book of Mark is the only gospel to describe Jesus ascending into heaven. Should I say that again? The book of Mark is the only gospel to describe Jesus ascending into heaven. So let's look at the book of Mark. Wouldn't that make sense? Let's check this guy out. The earliest manuscripts of Mark 16 break off abruptly at Mark 16, 8, where these men empty the tomb and announce Jesus' resurrection. This verse lacks any post-resurrection appearance of Jesus. 
The modern text of Mark 16, 9 through 20 does not appear in these earlier manuscripts. The resurrection in the book of Mark 16, 9 through 20 was added to the end of Mark by an unknown author sometime after the latter part of the second century. This is a fact admitted by most New Testament scholars today. This isn't like challenged by people who are uh, in the know. People who are hearing this for the first time are going to have to look this up because this changes everything, right? No, it doesn't change anything. The Jews were waiting for a Messiah for over a hundred years before the Christ story, and they're still waiting right now. This addition to the manuscript was like bait used to lure the Jews and others over to Christianity. There's a lot more going on than a warm fuzzy feeling when the choir is singing on Easter morning while the stained glass is suddenly lit up above the altar as it becomes illuminated with the morning sunlight. And it goes way beyond the timing as well. The cathedrals were often designed to use these seasonal sunlight uh, appearances, if you will, to visually denote certain dates. This is a huge key to understanding the greatest story ever told. Within the walls of the great cathedrals, our ancestors would, they would reenact these yearly celestial events, taking upon themselves the roles of the gods, the sun, the stars, even the seasons. Man becomes God in the act of binding himself to the heavens and the earth. We'll talk about the earth part in just a minute. But as above, so below, right? There's, there's always this history beyond the tradition. The ritual explains the myth. The myth explains the ritual. This is Angkor Wat on the spring equinox. This this wasn't built recently, okay, and neither was this. The serpent shadow on the Mayan temple at Chichen Itza, on the spring equinox. Not too far away from there, the temple of the seven dolls, on the spring equinox. This wasn't done by accident. He is risen. Happy Easter. Rather than reenact these celestial events, I thought I'd just show you what's happening in the sky. So this is the first day of spring. First day of spring, and notice where the sun is located. Just You can just point your finger right there at the sun and keep your finger in that spot. I'm going to change the slide right now. Okay, six months later, you see where the sun has gone? Should I go back and forth? I could. By the time autumn arrives, 9.21.12, still 8.30 a.m., okay? The sun is still high in the sky, but this is all about to change. 12.21.12, 12. where is the sun? Still 8.30 in the morning, but the sun has fallen to its death. Winter is about to begin. And up until this point, the sun has appeared to move to the south uh, one degree every day. If you were closer to the Arctic Circle, you would notice that for a three-day period, December 22nd, 23rd, and 24th, for this three-day period, the sun has fallen in the sky all one degree every day until it just disappears. And for three days, the sun is below the horizon. The sun is dead. The sun is in the cave. And guess what happens on December 25th? Let's not get ahead of ourselves. The stories often tell of a hero sun god being born under a star. And you can look into other legends and see this same archetype. If you want to dig deeper into this, I'll turn you on to DM Murdoch uh, and her research. This is a good book to begin with. 
So we can't really wrap our brains around this uh, where we sit. Uh, we have a lot of light pollution. That's one of the amazing things about the Keck Observatory on the Big Island of Hawaii is altitude. Now, if you're driving up to this observatory, you get to this cloud layer and you think, man, it's so cloudy tonight, I'm not going to be able to see anything. You kind of start to get bummed out, but you, you're halfway up this mountain and there's no way you're going to turn around, right? You climb up to like 13,000 feet and everything kind of starts to break apart and get clear and you can see the stars in a way that you've never been able to see the stars before. It almost makes you angry that you can't see the stars like this every night at your house. But we have so many lights on, especially here in Dallas, that light pollution prevents us from witnessing this amazing light show without traveling to the top of a mountain on a tiny island in the middle of the ocean. I mean, this is an actual photograph. Our ancestors saw this in the sky, night after night, no matter where they were. And then you have to take into account, these stars appeared to be moving across the sky. So, if you turn to the north and you look at these stars, you'll find all of the circumpolar stars. So basically, you know, you can point your camera at the right star and you make the right time lapse setting on your camera and you hit go and you get a picture that kind of looks like this. Um, but what a lot of people don't think about is this, these are the circumpolar stars. These are the stars that spin around the pole without ever going uh, across the horizon. But if you were to point that same camera to the east or to the west, you would notice that the stars appear to rise and set just like the sun does. So now think of the stories that could be told. We have this giant bright star that lights the day and all of these other characters to make these stories with because we don't have TV and distractions like that going on. This is how the stories were made. So let's dissect this a little bit. Given this information, if you look to the east as we enter the Christmas season, you'll find Orion's belt on the night before Christmas. Now only Matthew mentions the presence of a star in the east. He's the only one to mention wise men who would follow it as well. And he doesn't mention the number, but any astro-theological philosopher will tell you that those wise men were three wise men and they are connected to the three stars of Orion's belt. Of course, this is completely symbolic. I mean, why would wise men need to follow a star to get from Jerusalem to Bethlehem? It's only like eight miles away. They could probably walk this in the dark without following stars. So here's the night sky facing the east, and these wise men are going to follow this star. Let's, let's not call them the men. Let's look at the stars. There's the three stars of Orion's belt. And just below this constellation of the three stars of Orion's belt is Sirius. And Sirius was said to be the most important star to the ancient Egyptians. And if we were to stay out here all night and just stare at the same location where Sirius is over that little mountain there, we would see that this is the same location where the sun is born the following day. So the stars are not always like this. During other seasons, the stars are nowhere near this formation. Just days prior to Christmas, the stars are not quite in the correct spot at the correct time. Here, it's already dark, and the stars are already out when Orion's belt appears on the horizon. It's 6.50 p.m. And you notice that this is the 11th of December. So we skip ahead here. The cutout is where Orion's belt is at this time of day. This is just days after Christmas, 
and again the stars are not quite in the correct spot at the correct time. Even if you were to go back to the 1st of January, the last star on Orion's belt clears the horizon at like 4.55. Here we are on the 9th, and this is where Orion's belt is at 5 p.m. Before it had already been dark for a while before Orion's belt hit this point. Now it isn't quite dark enough to expose the stars. So during these dates only, when the new sun is born, can these three kings that make up Orion's belt be found on the horizon just at the moment that the sky is dark enough to expose the stars on the eastern horizon. All of the timing is precise. The moment of Easter and the moments that lead into the Christmas morning. Here is one minute. It's been, it's been Christmas for one minute. Right at midnight, the head of Virgo peeks over the eastern horizon. And here she is at 4.30 in the morning. And this is, of course, where the sun will be born on Christmas morning. But just before she gives birth to the sun, she crushes the head of the serpent. Serpents. Soon, the New Year's sun will be born just below Virgo, right here, as if the Virgin has given birth to her son, our Savior, the light of the world. And this is the moment of the New Year. And notice we're facing east, and this is the sunrise on Christmas morning here, and Aquila, the bird, appears to be above the earth with the light of the sun. So the bird is above the earth, even though we're facing east, the light is above and the bird is above the earth it, from this perspective. Aquila sitting atop a great sphere might look familiar, depending on your background. Now, of course, we can't see these stars, but they're there. And if we were to turn and see the stars that were in the west at this moment, we would see Hydra, the serpent. So above us with the light is the bird, and below us is the serpent in the darkness. It begins to look a little bit like the Yggdrasil tree, the Gnostic Yggdrasil tree. This is this tree, although it's used in several different philosophic circles, this tree is actually a date and it marks New Year's or what we call Christmas. Just as we have the as above so below philosophy um, in, in Christian tradition, especially Gnostic Christian tradition, those who recognize this, you will recognize on earth as it is in heaven. The symbol is all-encompassing. The enormous and the tiny, the, the within and the without. There's no such thing as duality. We're all connected. There's only one. But this duality is found within the whole. Everything is connected at the quantum level. The large gets larger and larger and larger in one direction and the small just keeps getting smaller and smaller and smaller in the other direction. I mean, if you go to CERN and you say, what are you guys doing over here? They'd say, well, we keep taking these particles and we start slamming them together and whatever it is, it just keeps getting smaller and smaller and smaller. And the further in you go, the bigger the mystery gets. I see it again as more of a philosophical method, like pixels on a TV screen. You recognize different shapes as people or other objects. But the TV set, it doesn't give you any more information than you need to hear and see its message. You know, the further in you go, if you zoom in far enough, you realize that it's all just made of light. Just like the quantum theory explains our reality. The further in you go, bigger it gets and soon it becomes all energy or light and again like I said you go to NASA and you ask these guys what they're doing they're like well we, we're zooming out and we're trying to see how big it can get 
or how far away we can get. And just as soon as you think you've figured out the size of the universe, you discover these multiverse. It's like the further you zoom out, the bigger it gets, whatever it is. I think it is infinite in both directions. And I think shamans have known this all along, and the scientists are slowly coming around to this. This interconnected web of life that flows through the entire universe. You know, if we are alive, then it is if we are connected, and we are. So that is the everything that I would give the attributes of all-knowing, all-powerful, omnipresent. This is the only definition of God that I can accept, and from my upbringing in Christianity, it feels like this is the only definition of God that I should accept. Omniscient, omnipresent, and omnipotent. That's what God should be. See, we direct our consciousness through this fractal that we live in. We make small mouth noises that give us meaning into the shapes and the patterns that we see, but those shapes and patterns, and even the words that we use to describe them, are all based on a vibration. Whether they're vibrating particles that we see with our eyes, or vibrating sound waves that we hear with our ears and interpret, everything is connected. Everything. The only thing that separates us from one another, seemingly, is consciousness. Unless that isn't separate either. So, when you think of it this way, we are it. We are the eyes and the ears of God. We are collecting data for this larger universal consciousness. The divine creative force, as Alex Gray would say. The evolution of this divine creative force into consciousness and self-awareness started with the Big Bang. Life has evolved from pure light. Where did we come from if we didn't come from pure light? And it's of course gone into these higher and higher forms of order and intelligence to the point of self-discovery and that's what we're doing we're discovering ourselves when we look into the sky know thyself that's what the universe is doing every time we look into the stars every time we learn something new about ourselves that's what the universe is doing learning about itself through us. So you are the universe expressing itself as a human. The universe. What you put into your mind, you're putting into the mind of God. You know, it can sound cliche to say that, that our consciousness is the tip of the spear when it comes to consciousness in the universe. Uh, Terrence McKenna said it best, I think, he put it this way, what we represent is not a sideshow or an epiphenomenon or an ancillary something or other on the edge of nowhere. What we represent is the nexus of concrescent novelty that has been moving itself together, complexifying itself, folding itself in upon itself for billions and billions of years. There is, so far as we know, nothing more advanced than what is sitting behind your eyes. The human neocortex is the most densely ramified, complexified structure in the known universe. We are the cutting edge of organismic transformation of matter in the cosmos. This degree of self-discovery is one of the reasons the psychedelic experience is important. Another reason is it allows the shaman to break through the barriers of culture and society and 
take a peek behind the curtain as we map the uncharted territories of our consciousness. This, this uncharted territory of our consciousness was something of profound importance to our ancestors. Today, this territory is marked throughout with no trespassing signs, as these states of consciousness have become off-limits. One of the things that I study is called archaeoinebriology. Archaeoinebriology. One of these is poisonous and will kill you if you eat it. Uh, the other one is called the Golden Teacher for a very good reason. The one on the right, the psychedelic mushrooms. It's not poisonous. And it's been used in shamanic voyages, mystery school initiations. It's been used for personal enlightenment and for religious purposes all throughout history. You know, which one of these is illegal today? A system is in place to protect us from these psychedelic mushrooms when no system of laws are in place to protect us from poisonous mushrooms. Just the ones that grease the wheels for thinking outside the box and questioning the status quo. Today our culture is so terrified of these realms of consciousness that we don't even dare mention an interest in such a thing in mixed company. The term psychedelic is derived from ancient Greek. The ancient Greek word psyche, meaning the mind or the soul, and delios, meaning manifest, translating into soul or mind manifesting. Manifesting the mind is a frightening yet beautiful experience. Some people struggle because they think that they've eaten too much. They, they start believing that they're going to have a bad trip, but the truth is they're most likely afraid of the experience and probably didn't take enough. At the proper dose, you aren't able to struggle or resist. You're along for the ride, you know? There's, there's no escape and there's no analyzing the situation while you're in it. With a high dose of psychedelic mushrooms, it feels as if time stops and everyday consciousness dissolves into a fractal of reality. And once this happens, you make contact with something on the other side. And that something is just as alive as you are. This is well documented. A very high number of people who have eaten these mushrooms have reported a connection with something that speaks to them in their own language. Now, Terrence McKenna once said that, Going to the grave without ever having a psychedelic experience is like going to the grave without ever having sex. The shaman uses these mushrooms as a tool to master all states of consciousness, and that is their birthright. It is our birthright. Shamanism is about mastering altered states of consciousness. All of them. But the big one, the big one, right, is death. And a shaman journeys into these altered states of consciousness as a way to prepare for this ultimate journey. These people were mastering their consciousness. We were once masters of our own personal consciousness. And when we started to substitute such a unique experience with a placebo, the ritual started to outweigh the reality, and this allowed others to act as mediators between us and the divine. We don't need a mediator. The one thing that permeates and connects all the world's religions is symbolism. Understanding the meaning behind the symbol will reveal an even deeper connection. This tree, the, the wise ones are the ones who can walk up to these religious trees and digest its fruit because the fruit is the same no matter which symbolic branch it comes from. 
But this is where things get interesting for my research, because I study the history of sacred plants. I find it interesting that a sacred meal is found in nearly every mystery tradition and every religion all throughout antiquity. And it's even a part of our modern day religion and ritual. But keep in mind, when compared to the origin, it is a placebo. When a group of individuals takes control over someone's birthright, a personal shamanic connection with their higher consciousness, we're suddenly within the realm of religious control, even mind control, if you think about it. And the keeping of this secret, that this is a placebo, was very important at a time when one religion tried to force a monopoly on religion itself. There is always history beyond the tradition. And some of these greatest aspects of the ancient mysteries were kept secret until very recently, when books like this started to surface. Where you find, of all the mysteries celebrated in the ancient times, the Eleusinian mysteries were held to be the ones of greatest importance. After fasting, the Kikion, or Kikion, was consumed. There's no doubt the Kikion was a psychedelic substance. If these secret recipes fell into the wrong hands, the mysteries would have never come to light. So the secrets have kept them alive all this time. So let's revisit this story about Jesus speaking in parables. I love Legos. I grew up playing with Legos. I can relate to Legos. So Jesus is asked, why do you speak to them in parables? And he said, the secret of the kingdom of God is granted to you but to those on the outside, everything comes in parables, so that they may look and look, but never perceive, and listen and listen, but never understand. Otherwise, they might change their ways and be forgiven. The truth became a myth, and the myth became truth. And I think the least offensive place that I've found to introduce the truth that became a myth is through Christmas because Christmas is it is a myth it's mythology but it's also more of a tradition that's easily dissectable and it's full of it's full of these virtual Easter eggs that we're looking for I call these the Christmas mysteries mysteries because you know Christmas is connected to elves fairies and gnomes and these crazy stories in mysticism and folklore and a lot of the time you'll see these cards with this red and white mushroom with a snowman or with a gnome a lot of the times with a gnome that's very common but you'll notice if you'll remember back to what I was saying with the date of Christmas and the date of New Year's. It's the same holiday. That moment in time is actually the moment of the beginning of the new sun cycle, the new cycle of light. And this card kind of reflects that. Merry Christmas and Happy New Year. It's all in one, all encompassing with the mushroom being hung on the door um, for luck or maybe there's something more to that. This mushroom does exist in nature. It's real. It's called the Amanita muscaria mushroom or the fly agaric. Agaric just means guild. So what happens when you eat this mushroom? Well, you get a sensation of flying. My first experience with this mushroom was just grinding the dried mushroom into a powder. And by grinding this mushroom into a powder for, gosh, over an hour, I've used 
a, a blender and a coffee grinder and before you know it there's this powder in the room and I don't know how much I breathed but by the end of the time I felt like I was floating couldn't feel my feet I felt like I could go hiking for hours I wasn't tripping there was no hallucinations um, but that was one of the feelings that I felt when you do eat this mushroom it's preferred that you eat it dried, and I'll talk about that in just a minute. But some of the stages that you go through are sweating, a drunkenness, an out-of-body, full-blown psychedelic experience that some report as a near-death experience or a death-like experience. I know you've seen this mushroom somewhere before today. As a matter of fact, I would be surprised if you haven't seen this mushroom. This mushroom has become an icon in our culture. Well, not just our culture, everywhere. I mean, maybe, maybe you've never seen this mushroom. I mean, if you're living your entire life in Malaysia or something like that. Uh, okay, maybe Malaysia was a bad example. These mushrooms... They flourish under birch, larch, cedar, pine. They have a symbiotic relationship with the roots of these trees. A symbiotic relationship, not a parasitic relationship. They feed the tree nutrients, and the trees feed them nutrients. They work together in harmony. They flourish under pine trees. And they're not always easy to get to. When these mushrooms attach to the roots of the tree, they participate in what is called mycorrhizal symbiosis. But these mushrooms would not be able to survive without this tree. Much like a fruit wouldn't be able to survive without the tree. These mushrooms are very close cousins to the fruiting body of a tree. These are more like the secret, hidden fruit. Now we know that when it snows in Russia, it really snows in Russia. Especially up in western Siberia. And this is where we have to go if we wish to track down the origins of mushroom mythology. And how do the indigenous people up there live? Well, they're nomads. The shaman that live up there are nomadic. They live in a symbiotic relationship with reindeer. They help the reindeer give birth. They help the reindeer find food. Uh, they migrate with the reindeer. Of course, they eat the reindeer and they use every part of the reindeer in their life. One of the interesting things that they do when the animals migrate is they pack up their homes and migrate with them. Well, the, the shamans of Northern Europe, particularly Siberia and Lapland, held a position, I don't think, very different from shamans of anywhere else around the world, uh, that very important position of a person who acted to help both the physical and the spiritual needs of their people. They were a mixture of a doctor uh, and a religious person uh, all rolled into one, and a counsellor as well, important people. But the shamans of the area I'm interested in were those who were associated with tribes, tribes like the Samai people, um, who for thousands of years have made their life and their living from reindeer. Not as easy as doing it from, say, cattle or sheep, because reindeer are nomadic animals, and they need to move to different pastures, uh, different times of the year. They give birth at different places from where they overwinter. So the people who are looking after them, including the shamans, uh, need to travel, and therefore they need a portable form of tent, uh, uh, a form of yurt in a sense, uh, and they need to be intimately involved with the animals. They help them give birth, they protect them. 
I find it a wonderful way of life. In return, they get the meat, they drink the blood, they get the milk, they get the skins for their yurts, they get their clothing. It's very much a symbiotic relationship. We've been using inebriants and things to get out of our head for as far back as we can trace human history. Um, these shaman that migrate with the reindeer, when you think of Russia, you think of maybe vodka, right? But not only can you not brew alcohol at minus 40 degrees below, and even if you could, it'd be very time consuming and very heavy to carry around when you migrate from one place to the next. But eating that mushroom that contains a, a poison called ibotenic acid, um, when one of the symptoms of eating this poison is increased body temperature and sweating, that actually might come in handy. You might not even break a sweat. You might just raise your body temperature to the point where you're more comfortable. Now the reindeer, they love the Amanita muscaria. They love to eat it so much that they often beat the shaman to the flush. And this is a really good way to call and count the reindeer. You gather a few mushrooms because you know that they love these things and they come running over into one location. Just put some bells on your boots every time it's mushroom feeding time and Pavlov's dogs are Pavlov's reindeer all of a sudden but also they would have helped with the herding of the reindeer. We know that the reindeer also love the red and white mushroom, and sometimes the red and white mushrooms are put out to bring the reindeer down from the mountain areas so that they can be counted, so that they can be culled. There's even lovely examples where reindeers discovered that human urine can sometimes be of interest too. Early travellers had lovely experiences where they went out behind the hut to have a wee and the reindeer came crashing down after them. So, interesting experiences. The shaman, the reindeer, the mushroom, the peoples, and it was part and parcel of it, knowing about the seasons, of realising that one went to the gods to find out what was wrong with someone. The shaman would come in down the chimney. There was only one opening to the yurts. The fire, the smoke from the fire went out that same, uh, same opening. So coming down the chimney as the, th the typical Father Christmas figure is still there with this earlier shaman figure. But of course the shaman was bringing more important gifts because the gift of healing uh, of a medicine person is to my mind much more important than any physical gifts which we often associate with Christmas today. Well, one thing is for sure, there was a human-animal connection between the reindeer and the shaman. Just between my dog and I, we have this amazing connection, but just imagine being responsible for an entire herd of reindeer. And notice how wet my dog's nose is. Animals have a tendency to do this. They kind of froth at the mouth and the nose. And with this white dog here, you can tell that it's been eating kibble with its wet snout and the dog food has discolored the dog's fur around his nose. Well, look who else has white fur around their nose. And instead of this fur getting wet and turning brown when they eat brown dog food, their fur gets wet and it will turn red as it eats the red mushroom. So yeah, perhaps there is a connection between the Siberian shaman who is shown to us today dressing in the colors of the mushroom by tradition and his reindeer companion who also eats the same mushroom. So they fly through the sky together, flying through the air with the Amanita muscaria. This has been shown in, in artwork and Christmas, New Year's cards, all throughout our past. My friend Clark Heinrich let me use some of his photos from his book and from uh, his lectures. I strongly encourage you to check out his work. Uh, a good place to begin is Magic Mushrooms in Religion and Alchemy. And again, his name is Clark Heinrich. So here you kind of see the boneyard. Only the caps are used and the stalks are discarded. 
And unlike some mushrooms where you just see these little buttons growing on the ground, these mushrooms, the Amanita muscaria, can get quite large. And one thing that happens when you dry these mushrooms is, well, for one, they get smaller and they get lighter because the water has evaporated out, they've dried, and they go through another process called decarboxylation. Now I'll talk about decarboxylation in just a second, but one thing that happens in this decarboxylation process is the ibotenic acid, which is um, kind of an unsettling uh, chemical to have in your system, it's what causes all of the sweats and the nausea. Uh, this ibotenic acid evaporates with the water. It leaves the mushroom during this decarboxylation process. And the musamol, which is the active ingredient, uh, intensifies. So you get a decrease in the part of the mushroom that makes you kind of sick and an increase in the part of the mushroom that is psychedelic just by drying these things. So you can imagine the shaman walking through the pine forest looking for these mushrooms and he knows where to look because they are the gifts hidden underneath the Christmas tree. But now the shaman is faced with a challenge because these mushrooms are heavy, they're large, and if he's going to fill a giant sack full of these things and take them back to where he's going to dry them out, um, the weight of the heavy mushrooms on the top of the bag are going to crush all of the wet mushrooms on the bottom of the bag and by the time he gets home he's going to have mush. So the solution to this problem is to find a tree in a central location and you hang your mushrooms on these trees and let them dry in the sun as you go collect more mushrooms. And by the end of the afternoon you have decorated your Christmas tree. And these Amanita muscaria Christmas tree ornaments are some of the oldest and most traditional Christmas tree ornaments that you can find. Now for personal use, the shaman would hang their wet stockings over the hearth of the fireplace and they would have warm stockings in the morning. And one obvious place to put a treat is inside those stockings, especially if that treat had to dry out overnight anyway. Putting mushrooms in a stocking like this and hanging them near a fireplace is a traditional way of drying these mushrooms. Now as I mentioned before, the shamans, or the shamaness in this instance, will dress in the colors of the mushroom. They embody the mushroom. They become the mushroom. The mushroom becomes them. Shamans all over the planet have tried to either personify their sacred plant or personify the effects that they feel when they've ingested these plants. So it's really no surprise when we see Santa Claus standing on a rooftop dressed in red with white trim carrying a whole big bag full of goodies. Um, now looking down the chimney is a, is a different story that kind of that has a different connection uh, we can get into that. The, the yurts, the homes, or the yurts that these nomads in Siberia would live in, they would pack these things up and move them uh, whenever they would migrate. The central entrance and exit was in the rooftop, and this is the same hole that the smoke would go through as the fire was set directly below it. This was their chimney, and this was also their front door. And it may seem a little bit silly to put the front door of your house in the ceiling, but here's what their yurt would have looked like after the snow drifts came in the middle of the night. You can't put a door on the side of these things because it will get snowed over. And this will also explain the pitter-patter sound of reindeer on your rooftop. You see, Clement Clark Moore wrote that poem in New York after interviewing people who came from all over the world. These legends came from all over the planet, not just Clement Clark Moore's mind. Now the ascent up and down the ladder or up and down the chimney 
is symbolic of climbing and descending the world tree, the axis of the earth. And we'll continue with ladders and their significance in just a little while. But for now, I don't, I don't advocate children drinking or eating mushrooms or, or cleaning chimneys for that matter. But so it's very important to realize and remember that there's always a history beyond the tradition. There's always a history beyond the tradition and the ritual. My friend Waldeck Borowiski is an amazing initiated artist, and I'm going to show some of his artwork periodically through the rest of the slideshow. I mean, if a picture can say a thousand words, then a symbol can say 10,000 words. Symbolism is almost, it is a language in and of itself. The alchemists were especially good at this. Telling a story with pictures is, is easy to do, but hiding a story within a story told in pictures is, is not so easy. When you hide something like that, whether it's intentional or unintentional, it falls into the realm of the occult. Anything that is hidden falls into the realm of the occult. And the, the occult is, is taboo. Even something as innocent as discussing the reason Easter falls on a different day every year. This is also a cult. But what is a cult ethnomycology? A cult being the knowledge of the hidden, and ethnomycology would be a study of the historical uses and the sociological impact of these mushrooms. Some people are surprised when they hear that entheogens, psychedelics, actually play a role in our myths and religions and folklore. But this subject is so amazingly deep. These, as I like to refer to them, these virtual Easter eggs, they've been hidden so well, so blatantly in plain sight. One of the places to find them is within the Dead Sea Scrolls. Many stories in the Bible are not original, including the story of Jesus. You know, history is written by the victors, right? So the Dead Sea Scrolls. These scrolls remained untouched until their discovery in 1946. So why is this important? Well, because this proves that these scrolls, unlike the Bible, remain unedited to this very day. The Essenes branched from Judaism and flourished during the 2nd century BCE to the 1st century CE, exactly when these scrolls were written. The Dead Sea Scrolls are often referred to as the Library of the Essenes. Some scholars contend, and I agree, that John the Baptist and Christ were Essene. And if Christ was real, he was an Essene. And when he was put to death, his disciples hid their mysteries. And they were soon contained within these very scrolls, and they remained unedited, untouched, until 1946. And anybody that knows anything about religious history would know that these scrolls are a big deal. They were written during the time and at the location where Jesus is said to have lived. These were important documents, make no mistake about it. So what happened? In 1946, when these scrolls were discovered, what happened? The church jumped. That's what happened. A team consisting of the world's best translators was assembled. And this man here was called into action. John Marco Allegro. Considered one of the world's leading philologists in regards to Middle Eastern and Mediterranean languages. He was the best of the best. He was one of the original team members. And he was the only philologist on the international team of translators. The only philologist. 
Oh, he was also the only original member who finished his assignment. John Allegro worked on these scrolls for 14 years. He didn't just take a look at it and then come to a conclusion. Have you ever worked on something for 14 years? If you have, you've probably become an expert in that subject. And after 14 years working on the Dead Sea Scrolls, Allegro announced that the entire Christian religion was based on a huge misunderstanding. Uh-oh, he wasn't supposed to say that. That's not what they hired him to say. He said that the whole of Christianity is based upon fertility cults and psychedelic mushroom use. Uh-oh, that'll get your career destroyed. And of course his career was destroyed. But he stuck to his findings, even when it cost him his job and his reputation. He believed that Jesus was the mushroom. I believe that Jesus was a person speaking in parables, playing the role of the mushroom in a mystery play. This was one way to throw off the Romans. Today, most of the stories in the Bible are still told in parables. So I believe that speaking as the mushroom take and eat this is my body was a way of hiding the recipe itself the ingredient so here are some things that John Allegro had to say during an interview now imagine how this must have sounded to the uneducated and who was educated about these things no one so just set your mind back in the times when when everything was black and white and listen to what John Allegro said on television. I'm puzzled. Uh, are you really seriously suggesting that Jesus Christ was a mushroom? I uh, put pretty blankly, yes. Surely you don't suggest that Jesus Christ and his various disciples were not human creatures. Yes. You are dealing with a, a secret cult, a secret society. The stories of the New Testament contain certain incantations certain magic names were which were really the names of the mushrooms. No, but and the writers, the writers, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, these men who wrote the mm. story, you are telling me they did not exist? No. no. None of them existed? No. It, it's part of mythology. It's part of mushroom mythology. Now, I think the host might have just thrown up in his throat a little bit, but it serves him right. If he thinks a guy named Mark walked around Palestine back then, writing things down, he's naive. He hasn't done the study. He doesn't really know the history. You know, I talk about the word entheogen. I throw this word around quite a bit, and I need to break it down. I think entheogen, right? Within, theo, and generate. Something that generates God within you. Now, these are usually plants or near-death experiences. Near-death experiences are very rarely referred to as entheogens. Usually these things are sacred plants. Mushrooms, ayahuasca, peyote, cannabis, even LSD. Finding God. What if a pill could help you find God faster? Well, a controversial medical study claims an illegal, hallucinogenic drug could do just that. But it's setting off a controversy in the medical community. Joining us to explain a little bit more about this study is Dr. James E. Smith, professor and chairman of the Physiology and Pharmacology Department at Wake Forest University Baptist Medical Center. Welcome, doctor. Good morning. Well, how is this different than when I was growing up and hearing about Timothy Leary uh, giving LSD and other hallucinogenics? Well, we were growing up at the same time, uh, and it's very different in that this was a very rigorous uh, scientific study, and one of the top-notch uh, human behavioral pharmacology laboratories actually in the nation. Well, the, the headline uh, attracted my attention. It says, Hallucinogenic in Mushrooms Creates Universal Mystical Experience. What is a mystical experience? I think a mystical experience is uh, one in which uh, individuals can have in various settings. Uh, it can be highly religious uh, circumstances, 
but generally it's a circumstance where one feels that one is really uh, communing with something more than themselves. Communing with something more than oneself. St. Paul would call this the Christ Consciousness. Communing with something more than yourself. Within yourself. Paul's letters were very important and anyone taking this topic seriously should investigate them. This communing with something other than yourself, within yourself. When Paul wrote about the Christ in you, this is exactly what he was talking about. Our essential identity, the fabric that makes us alive and conscious, is divine. Not our identity, not how we appear to each other, but how we appear to ourselves when our ego is dissolved. Paul was one of the earliest Christians. His letters are at the roots of Christianity. Many people don't realize Paul's letters were written before the Gospels. Paul's letters were written before the Gospels. But in the New Testament, it's the other way around. And the Gospel stories come first and Paul's letters follow. Well, Paul, I mean, is a fascinating character and in our reading is the one of the earliest Christians. Now, what's been cleverly done is that even traditional Christian scholars would accept that the Gospels were written, you know, the conservative guess is, is say, 90 AD for the first Gospel. Now, that would place the Gospels 40 years after Paul's letters. But in the New Testament, it's put the other way around. So you get the gospel stories first and then Paul's letters. When you come to Paul, you automatically think that the Jesus Christ that he's talking about is the Jesus Christ you've just been reading about in the gospels. And it took scholars quite a few centuries before they went and investigated Paul. What does he actually say about this Jesus figure? And what's amazing is that if you investigate Paul's original letters, his real letters, because there are quite a few forgeries in the New Testament, he makes no historical mention of a Jesus at all. In fact, when he comes to talk about uh, the great secret that's been stored up from the beginning of time that he's going to reveal to his, his listeners, he doesn't say it's that Jesus was born down the road in a shed and he's the son. He says the secret is this. Christ in you. So for Paul, if you read his letters, and I urge anybody to, to read them with an open mind, you will construct a cosmic Jesus Christ who never had any existence. You'll, you'll never hear anything about his parents, Mary and Joseph. You'll never hear anything about a virgin birth. You won't hear anything about where he was crucified. Or These are cosmic events. And, and I think the most telling of all is, you know, if you've been around anyone, who has had a recently dead guru, even if they haven't met them themselves, as Paul clearly says, he, he, he met a vision of light. Yeah. They, they, you know, oh, he did this, he said that, or, you know, I heard a story Because that's their way of proving their connection it's with the guru. It's all about the quotes from the guru. In Paul, yeah. we have none of this. Yeah. We simply have this figure that you die and resurrect with, and then you discover the Christ within, and that's, the message of the Gnostic Christians, who don't believe in an historical Jesus, and it's also the message of the ancient mysteries, where the same figure was called by different names, but was essentially also someone that you mystically died and resurrected, or come back, came back, you come back to life with or through. Mm. Yeah. Paul, Paul, is, Paul writes in the, in the language of the mysteries and the language of the Gnostics, and he's a, he's a much misunderstood figure. And the traditional uh, orthodox view would be many people call Paul the earliest heretic because they have a vision of uh, Jesus came to bring his message and Paul slightly distorted it and added a lot of Greek mythology and all the rest of it. Actually, if you turn the two around, what happened is that Paul came first with his Gnostic cosmic Christ and then the literalist came along and fashioned a story and perverted Paul's original message. We started talking about symbolism and the significance of symbolism and how symbolism is 
uh, 10,000 words if a picture is a thousand, right? Sometimes symbolism is blatant. You can see it. It's right there in front of your eyes. Sometimes it's not. And when it comes to mushroom symbolism, you can just kind of let your mind go. You might see a, a crown of thorns. Here's a close-up of the thorn itself. Maybe I should just let these pictures roll on for just a minute. Remember, the shaman dresses in the colors of their sacred plants, or mushrooms. And when the Christian Inquisition killed all the shaman, they stole their land, they stole their techniques, they stole their plant knowledge, they stole their traditions and their rituals, and they stole their garb. So don't get me started on that. That's for another day. Right now let's talk about the Amanita muscaria and its particular growth cycle. Here in this picture on the left, the mushroom has already been picked, and that's what this hole is, this black hole. It kind of looks like a bird's nest. And the white that you're seeing, those are the white spores. Little tiny, tiny little white spores. Uh, these are the seeds of the mushroom. And these mushrooms are really tough. That's what this white part of the mushroom is a really tough part of the mushroom, and it's hard and white like a stone at this stage as it breaks through the dirt. Uh, my friend Clark has a theory that the dirt will wedge itself inside the little spikes or thorns sticking out of the mushroom and as the mushroom grows it breaks apart the dirt by stretching it apart and cracking it and that allows it to break through some really tough soil. This is a picture of the base of the mushroom just as either the dirt has been scraped away or just as the mushroom has been picked uh, from including the base, not just cut at the dirt. So I have this slide to show these concentric rings around the mushroom and these rings around the mushroom are growth spurts. At night when the mushroom grows you can see where it has grown the night before. and as it shoots up and makes its stalk, you can still see the little concentric rings around the stalk of the mushroom. The veil of the mushroom, that kind of looks like a little apron or skirt worn by the mushroom, is what holds the spores. So when this annulus is attached, to the red part of the mushroom, all of the spores are contained up inside of it. And as the mushroom stretches and stretches and stretches, it stretches farther away than the annulus can attach itself, and it becomes detached. And when it becomes detached, it falls down here like an apron or a skirt, and all of the spores rain down onto the grass below. And that starts the cycle again. And at this point, the mushroom will enter into what is often referred to as a table stage. The mushroom cap will continue to turn upwards, and at this point, it will form a little cup. And at night, the dew, or perhaps uh, a little rain shower, the water will settle into the cup. And when this happens, take particular notice of the ring around the halo, if you will, around the mushroom. And this halo is caused because the water is absorbing all of the red pigment. And if you leave the water in there long enough, the entire mushroom will turn gold, or kind of a yellow gold. And the water will be blood red. So you could take this mushroom and you could eat, you could take and eat, or you could take and drink and there are holy grail legends that you can go on yourself from here. 
Now the legend of this mushroom is many thousands of years old, but it's not the only psychoactive substance to make its way into today's traditions and today's legends. And with that being said, let's talk about Moses for just a moment. For the first 40 years of his life, he was raised in the heart of Egypt by the daughter of a pharaoh. Who gets this opportunity? Not many of us. For 40 years he lived like this. He was groomed to be a pharaoh. If you're groomed to be a pharaoh, you're educated in the Egyptian mysteries. For 40 years, what can you learn in 40 years about the Egyptian mysteries when you're living like this? So with an understanding of the ancient mysteries beyond our comprehension, Moses then lives an obscure, humble life tending sheep for 40 years. Here he's living the life of a shaman. He's living off the land. And if you don't think that he's learned which plants are edible, which plants are poisonous, and which plants get you out of your head, then you're out of your head. He was a master of these things. So one day, while wandering about on Mount Sinai, Moses hears the voice of God coming from a bush. So the story goes. Mount Horeb and Mount Sinai are two names for the same location. Horeb is thought to mean a glowing heat, which seems to be a reference to me of the sun, while Sinai may be derived from the name Sin, the Sumerian deity of the moon. So Sinai and Horeb would be the mountain of the moon and the sun, respectively. So I do indeed suggest that Moses ingested a psychedelic substance at this point. However, I, I don't believe it was ayahuasca. I believe it was the Amanita muscaria mushroom. What happens after he has this experience? He becomes a leader. He's determined to go back to Egypt and free his people. His eyes were opened to what he needed to do. He found his calling. This, this sounds very familiar to anybody who's had a mind-blowing psychedelic experience. Who's like, you know, now they're set on their path. It's what happened to me. So he comes back down the mountain and he leaves Mount Horeb. He prays about it and he talks to God and... Apparently God is not in a bush any longer. He says, you know, go back to Egypt. For all those who wanted to kill you are dead. Path's clear, buddy. Go do your thing. So he goes back to Jethro, here dressed in purple, who's the priest of Midian. I believe Moses was marrying or had married his daughter at this point. He says, let me return to my people in Egypt and see if any of them are still alive. Yes, I'm still using Legos as a visual. So Jethro says, go do your thing. And he does. Moses goes back to Egypt and he says, let my people go. We've all heard this story a thousand times. He frees the people, but they kind of reject him, saying that, you know, you've, you've freed us from slavery just to bring us out here to die. Moses parts the waters, and they escape to their freedom. After he's freed these people, he brings them back home. He brings them back to the same mountain where he encountered God in the burning bush. He knew where to go. He knew where these mushrooms flourished. And what does he do? He goes back up to the same mountain. It's all about location. These people here are kind of having a new experience where Moses is, is back home, really. So Moses goes and he disappears up to the mountain 
to talk to God, and he leaves his brother Aaron in charge. So Moses knew exactly where to go and where to look for whatever substance it was that gave him direct access to what he believed was the voice of God. So while Moses is atop the mountain doing his thing, Aaron has everyone worshiping a golden cow. Now that's kind of strange. When you hear about this, that sounds kind of odd. That sounds like something that they would do in India, not here. And when Moses sees this, he's furious. He flips. There is a logical reason Aaron would think to have his people worship a cow. And this theory ties directly to manna. So let's go back. Let's go back to when the Israelites crossed over the sea, leaving the desert and entering into the wilderness. And they were starving and they were complaining. Moses, being this close to home, would have known the environment, including the plants and the animals and the mushrooms that lived there. He might have said something like, In the morning, God will rain down bread from heaven, and in the evening, God will send quails that we may have meat to eat. Meanwhile, he, he just knows that uh, mushrooms grow in the morning and uh, the birds come in at night. Um, I'll spare you this entire passage. Let me highlight some here. And it came to pass that evening the quails came up and covered the camp. So it was true. He, he knew that the birds would come. They would have meat to eat that night. And we know that the small round things were manna. They make a big deal about that. There are stained glass windows in nearly every church depicting manna. But not even quail feathers are sacred. But manna was kept in the Ark of the Covenant with the tablets of the new law. Something about this manna was far more significant than the quail from the night before. The manna was spiritual nourishment and the quail was physical nourishment. And in comparison, it's quite mundane. They probably had quail before. But the manna blew their minds. They kept the manna for several generations. They stopped talking about the quail on the next page. You call something, what is this, when it is mysterious. When it looks amazing and you can't tell what you're looking at, or when it does something to you that you just can't quite explain. This is a good book to send you on the right path. Keep in mind, this book will suggest that manna was a type of fungus called ergot that was more of an uh, infection that got into the bread that they ate. Moldy bread makes this mystical manna from God appear to be kind of a mistake. I find it more logical that this story was preserved because these people found something special not because these people accidentally ate bread that was laced with LSA. See, the manna, the manna was gathered. It wasn't baked. It may have looked like bread, but it wasn't bread. When the dew settled on the camp at night, the manna also came down. Now, they may not have known that the manna actually came up but the camp where they were sleeping at night didn't have mushrooms on the ground when they went to sleep. And when they woke up, they were everywhere. Many scholars will not debate the theory that manna was a mushroom. I just happen to think that it was a special mushroom worthy of putting in the Ark of the Covenant and not just a Croatian truffle. This is what many theologians believe was manna was a Croatian truffle. 
Okay, let's set that aside for a second and think about this. The Bible tells us that Jesus is the manna from heaven. Jesus said to them, Very truly I tell you, it is not Moses who has given you the bread from heaven, but it is my Father who gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is the bread that comes down from heaven and gives life into the world. And his disciples say, Give us this bread. And Jesus declares, I am the bread of life. Jesus is the manna. Jesus is not a Croatian truffle. But we're talking about a different mushroom here. We're not talking about the Amanita muscaria, the fly agaric. Now we're talking about the psilocybe mushroom containing psilocybin. Some refer to it as the psilocybe mushroom. And you see here psilocybe simulanciata. This is the Liberty Cap Mushroom. Liberty Cap. Liberty. Having another handful of these in your hand after you ate one handful of these and looking at those and saying, what is this, would make sense. A group of people with these mushrooms in their hands and a handful of these mushrooms in their bellies naming these mushrooms, what is this? because everybody is saying that makes sense to me. Moses knew that the quail would come in this area that evening and he knew several varieties of mushrooms would grow and he knew which mushrooms were which. And not only do these mushrooms come with the dew in the morning, these mushrooms flourish on cow dung. Notice the dew here in the picture. This is why when Moses was on the mountain talking to God and making the Ten Commandments, Aaron had everyone worshiping a cow. Moses understood that it wasn't the cow that makes the mushrooms. It was the divine food of the gods. And Jesus knew this too. He says, it wasn't Moses that brought you this stuff. It was my Father in heaven. It was divine. These mushrooms were so important, they were put into the Ark of the Covenant. Now let's think about that for just a moment. You can imagine what happens to freshly picked mushrooms if they're left outside overnight. If they're not properly dried, they'll ruin. They'll turn to mush. If these were sacred mushrooms, there would be strict rules concerning this matter. And it seems as though there were. Let no man leave it until morning. It could breed worms and stink. This is what mushy mushrooms do. Even if they remain unpicked, they'll turn to mush and wither away in the heat in the grass. These mushrooms should be picked in the early morning hours. You don't leave these things out in the sun. Even if they're still alive and attached to the mycelium below the ground. And if these mushrooms were sacred mushrooms, one should only pick what you could eat. Again, there would be strict rules about these things. And it seems as though there are. Every man according to his eating. And when the sun waxed hot, it melted. Yeah, they melt. It looks like they are melting. So if the bread from heaven is Jesus, and this bread from heaven is a psychedelic mushroom, then what is the Eucharist? If you eat psilocybin mushrooms, it is a very common thing for people to hear a voice speaking to them and often through them. It happens to almost everyone who eats a high dose of these mushrooms. It's extremely common and it's very well documented. You can just hit pause right now and go look this up. All throughout history, many people have heard a voice after eating this mushroom. And all throughout history, many have thought that this voice was the voice of God. And it does not matter what language you speak. 
When you eat this mushroom and that voice speaks to you, it speaks to you in your language. And the message is life-changing. And this mushroom can also be used medicinally because what this mushroom does, and I'm going to talk about this in just a little bit, is it breaks down barriers. The barriers that you have between um, life and death. Um, lots of different boundaries that we have in life, but one of the main ones is life and death, and it prepares you for your own death. My father died of lung cancer. By the time he discovered the cancer, he only had two weeks to live. My mom died of ovarian cancer. By the time she discovered her cancer, she only had 11 days to live. So I find it a bit of a personal connection to the woman in this next video. Once you have an illness diagnosed that's terminal, it really changes your viewpoint. Specifically with the cancer study, we're administering psilocybin as a treatment for serious mental suffering. Certainly, individuals with advanced cancer often have significant levels of existential anxiety. I had lost my faith because of anxiety, and I was just terrified. I was so anxious that I, it was hard to think about anything else. I didn't think I was so worried about death, but I was worried about the process of dying, about suffering and being in pain and having all kinds of horrible medical procedures. I was being irritable with my husband, Richard, uh, when I was so anxious and that that was a bad, a very bad thing because he's my caretaker, you know, when I'm ill and I was not being nice to him and treating him the way I should at all. She was irritable and we were both stressed out. I'm not saying it was her fault. The dynamic of the interaction between us often led to quarreling. We talked about my intention and my intention was to learn to control my anxiety so I could enjoy the rest of my life because I was not enjoying my life at all. I'm there with the subject for the entire six hours. We take a standard hospital room and my research coordinator fixes it up with wall hangings and uh, fabric so we really create a nice setting and patients are kind of cocooned. Lovely purple wall hangings and they brought orchids. I was thrilled with that. Um, and then I had one of my tonkas, my favorite tonka, right at the foot of my bed. And I advise them to go as deeply as possible into the experience. As soon as it started working, I knew I had nothing to be afraid of because it connected me with the universe. It was very gentle and there were people right there if I got upset. Everything looked absolutely beautiful. I didn't see things that weren't there. So this mushroom really shows you yourself and your life and it really puts things into perspective. It helps you prepare for your future. It helps you deal with your past. Even if your future is a serious moment, like the death of a loved one or the death of yourself, for some reason, somehow, this mushroom helps you see the bigger picture. Know thyself. This is what all of the great philosophers have said, ye are gods. Another one of the boundaries that it helps break apart is not, not just the boundaries between life and death, but the boundaries between self and other. This is ego disillusion. But it can feel, it can feel like an abduction by another, communing with something other than oneself now, some people have suggested that this mushroom is, and just bear with me here for a minute, this is a fun little theory, so I just want to play with it for a moment. Some people have suggested that this mushroom is an alien artifact. 
and that by eating this mushroom, that voice that you hear is true alien communication. So just bear with me as we explore this theory just for a moment. Now, and by now I mean in the last 10,000 years, we've been on to something new. Not genetic information, not genetic mutation, not natural selection, but epigenetic activity. Writing, theater, poetry, dance, art, ritual, philosophy. And these things have accelerated and accelerated and accelerated and accelerated. All of this has manifest out of this 1% difference between us and our ape ancestors. Uh, if you look at our closest genetic relative to human beings, it would be the chimpanzee. We share like 98 plus percent identical DNA. We are smarter than a chimpanzee. So let's invent a measure of intelligence that make humans unique. Let's say intelligence is your ability to like compose poetry, symphonies, do art, math and science, let's say, okay? Let's make that as the arbitrary definition of intelligence for the moment. Chimps can't do any of that. Yet we share 98, 99% identical DNA, okay? The most brilliant chimp there ever was maybe can do a little bit of sign language. Well, our toddlers can do that. Toddlers. So here's what concerns me deeply, deeply. Everything that we are that distinguishes us from chimps emerges from that 1% difference in DNA. Imagine another life form that's 1% different from us in the direction that we are different from the chimp. Think about that. We got 1% difference and we're building the Hubble telescope. Go, one, go another 1%. Who, what are we to they? We would be drooling, blithering idiots in their presence. That's what we would be. We would, they would take Stephen Hawking and roll him in front of their, their primate researchers and say, well, this one is like the most brilliant among them because he can do sort of astrophysics in his head. Oh, isn't that cute? Little Johnny can do that too. Oh, that's so nice. <laughs> In fact, Johnny just did that. Let me get it. It's, it's, it's on the refrigerator door. Here he is. He did it in his elementary school class. Think about how smart they would be. Quantum mechanics would be intuitive to their toddlers. Whole symphonies would be written by their children and, like I said, just put up on the refrigerator door the way our pasta collages are on our refrigerator doors. <laughs> So the notion that we're going to find some intelligent life and have a conversation with it? <laughs> when was the last time you stopped to have a conversation with a worm? <laughs> or a bird? Oh, well, you might have had a conversation, but I don't think you expected an answer, all right? <laughs> so. We don't have conversations with any other species on Earth with whom we have DNA in common. To believe that some intelligent other species is going to be interested in us enough to have a conversation? They'll look at our Hubble telescope and say, oh, isn't that quaint? Look at what they're doing. Another species interested in us enough to have a conversation. That's the thought I want to hold on to for a second. I think that could be a possibility. And perhaps, just maybe, it could be connected to an event that triggered our sudden evolution from these monkeys living in the trees to monkeys living in apartments. So what was it? Well, we were going to talk about aliens for a second, right? Okay. Well, now I'm not a UFO guy. I rarely look into space and wonder if there's some life out there. But I'm willing to explore the idea if you accidentally eat a psychedelic mushroom one day 
The next thing you know, you're surrounded by spirits. You hear a voice talking to you. The ebb and flow in and out of different frequencies. You've seen things that you've never seen before. The heavens open up and angels come flooding out of it and you think you see into another realm. This is an alien experience. Not little green men chasing you around a UFO with an anal probe. That's something that we've made up because we're silly. So what is alien communication? Well, this grasshopper knows what alien communication is. This grasshopper was tricked into jumping into the water by a hair worm. It was infected by a hair worm. And in the water, the worm left the insect to start its next portion of life. And the grasshopper drowned. The grasshopper was possessed by the worm and it was tricked into committing suicide. Now here's another example of alien communication. This is a cordyceps mushroom. This is an example of, of a fungus communicating with another species. After ingesting the spores of the mushroom, the ant's brain is affected and its behavior begins to change. The ant climbs to a leaf high up in the tree. Then the mushroom kills the ant and it sprouts out the top of his head and releases more spores from an elevation way high up in the tree, high enough to ensure its life cycle continues. Now I say this just to show that this is a method of embedding data in a fungus. But what if, and just what if, this method of embedding data into a fungus could be used for more of a symbiotic interspecies communication. When it comes to interspecies communication with the aliens, we've gone out of our way. We look to the sky waiting for an answer, for some sort of a sign that there's life out there, but what if we were looking in the wrong direction? What if extraterrestrial life is already here? How would they communicate with us? And with that being said, I will let Terrence McKenna say a few words here on this subject. And this is something I'm going to, um, you know, try and convince the UFO community of. What we drug people have that you don't is repeatability. <laughs> and the scientists always said to you UFO people, what you don't have is repeatability. They don't want to even talk to us. <laughs> but it is true that, that when you smoke DMT, for example, at a sufficiently high and prepared dose, you get elves. Everybody does. Uh, you may not believe it, but on the other hand, it only takes five minutes to prove that I'm bullshitting you a hundred percent. Surely anyone who studied UFOs and alien intelligence for as many years as the people represented here have can afford to invest ten minutes in the wild-eyed assertion that all you need do is inhale deeply three times and you know you want contact you want elves you want alien intelligence you'll have it up the kazoo not all psychedelics are alike and this very small family of compounds called the tryptamine hallucinogens bear careful examination if we're seriously interested in this question of extraterrestrial penetration of the human world. On two grounds, immediately, the mushroom bears looking at. First argument, entirely a physical argument. Psilocybin is for phosphoryloxy NN dimethyltryptamine. What this means is, is that there is a phosphorus group substituted at the four position of the molecule. Now, here's the headline, folks. This is the only four phosphorylated 
Indo on this planet. On this planet. Now, if you were searching for extraterrestrial thumbprints on the biology of Earth, you would look for molecules that are unique, that cannot, don't have near relatives spread through other life forms. In psilocybin, we have a perfect example of this. It is the only four phosphorylated indole known to occur in nature. Nature doesn't work like that, folks. Nature builds always on what has previously been accomplished. So this is a red flag saying at the molecular level, this thing looks like an alien artifact at the molecular level. Now, let's cut to the chase. What happens when you take 30 milligrams of this stuff? <laughs> Psychedelic experiences at effective doses, I'm not piddling doses, effective doses, are visionary scenarios. They are three-dimensional unfoldments of information that is extraordinarily complex, architectonically connected, and ordered. That's not what I want to talk about. I want to talk about what is unique to psilocybin. What is unique to psilocybin is that overlaid over what I just described is, big surprise, a voice. A voice. Everybody knows this who has to do with this stuff. Gordon Wasson, Richard Schultes, Albert Hoffman. The giants know that this stuff is animate. This is not a drug. It's something which is disguising itself as a drug in order not to spread alarm. There is a voice which speaks to you in the language of your homeland, whether that be Mazatecan or English. And the voice surprises you. In other words, you cannot anticipate it. Now, of course, at this point, though I don't imagine many of them have forced their way in here, the psychological school will come forward and say, well, it's a voice, a typical of a mental aberration, symptom one of schizophrenia, a voice. Yes, yes, we are not naive. We read that we went to the same schools you did, thank you. If you really wanted to study a aboriginal race and you really had a hot technology, what you would do is you would study their social psychology and you would say, are there any chinks in the armor of their expectations about how reality behaves? And you would discover in studying us this species intoxicates itself and it has a curious attitude towards its intoxications. Anything goes. So if somebody drinks a pint of Stolichnaya and announces that they see pink elephants, we are all amused. We say, of course you do, you were drunk out of your mind. Isn't it obvious that an alien would hide its presence in an intoxication? That this is the non-invasive, tasteful, respectful way to have intercourse with another species. You say, you put yourself into a plant. You put a barcode into a molecule. Then the shaman intoxicates himself and he says, aha, it's an ancestor spirit or it's the soul of the plant. But whatever it is, it's giving me good information. It's telling me where the reindeer went. It's telling me what the weather will be next week. It's telling me who stole the goose, and it's telling me who slept with who, and it's telling me who among the ill members of my tribe will live and who will die. And with that information, I can make a political career <laughs> as a healer. So let's play with this theory for just another couple of minutes. Let's say one day our 
monkey ancestors are hanging out in the trees, eating insects and berries. And then all of a sudden, everything suddenly changes. Simultaneous volcanoes, earthquakes, hell on earth. This is the Great Rift Valley, where all of that really happened. Africa's tectonic plates shifted, literally ripping northern Africa in half. Volcanoes changed the landscape forever. The canopy of trees that covered this landscape, where our monkey ancestors once thrived, vanished. Our ancestors were forced from the trees down to land, where they became hunter-gatherers. You know, we didn't survive because we're the biggest or the strongest, we survived because we were able to outthink our prey. Our consciousness sets us apart. This drive for more and more consciousness paved the way to the consciousness that we enjoy today. Our early primate ancestors would follow indigenous cattle, or the African forest buffalo, for example. And they would follow cattle like this because they just had a knack for finding water. And as we evolved, our connection to the cattle was sustained. It actually evolved as well. This may lie behind the very early coincidence of cattle, goddesses, and mushrooms in the apparent obsessions of early man as reflected by the cave paintings on the Algerian plateau and in southern France and Spain. We always find the notion of the mystery <coughs> circa 18,000 years ago connected with the idea of cattle and we always find the cattle connected with the notion of the great goddess now it may be that the hidden and third member of this trinity was a hallucinogenic mushroom of some mm -hmm. sort. The mushrooms grow in the manure of the cattle. When the hunting packs of early primates followed along behind the cattle, they inevitably encountered the mushroom, ate it, had their visual skills thereby increased, bred more readily, therefore, and survive more easily than their non-mushroom-eating cousins. And so the eating of mushrooms and the development of higher aspects of consciousness, including self-reflection, were thereby enforced, leading to the conclusion that it was actually a symbiotic relationship between early primates and these hallucinogenic plants that laid the basis for the appearance of what we call human beings. Well, Terence McKenna, this is a very interesting discussion. You seem to be suggesting that our evolution, I suppose, from the animal kingdom into the human kingdom itself was catalyzed or, or triggered by our encounter with these hallucinogenics. And Yes, we are an ape with a symbiotic relationship to a mushroom and that has given us mm -hmm. self-reflection, language, religion and all the spectrum of effects that flow from mm -hmm. these things. Yeah, and one can only wonder how these hallucinogens might affect our future evolution as well. They have brought us to this point and as we make our relationship to them conscious we may be able to take control of our future evolutionary mm -hmm. path. So I know that he blasted right through some of this theory, and I just kind of want to hit on it for a moment. Um, our primate ancestors followed behind these cattle to find food and water. These psychedelic psilocybe mushrooms, or psilocybe mushrooms, grow on the dung of cattle, even elephant dung. Low doses of this mushroom will sharpen your vision. This would give the animal who ate this mushroom an advantage in the hunt, an advantage over their prey and over any non-mushroom-eating primates. Medium doses of this mushroom will cause arousal, including sexual arousal. So they would have plenty of food from their hunt and plenty more offspring as well. 
higher doses of this mushroom will trigger self-awareness. And sometimes, that voice that speaks in your language, what would they have heard? And another side effect, when you hear that voice, is to repeat what that voice is saying, to vocalize your thoughts. Our natural drive for more and more consciousness, coupled with this psychedelic mushroom, could be the keys that unlocked our human potential. It's this drive for more and more consciousness that led to science, and culture, technology, written language, poetry, dance, music, all of the things that come from that 1% difference between us and our ape ancestors. The shaman found this tradition of eating the mushroom to be so important that they kept this tradition for thousands of years until one day this pattern was broken. And today, I believe that we are asleep at the wheel. The traditional use of these mushrooms was hijacked by men attempting to control the world via religion and faith. Faith instead of experience. As Albert Pike said, this truth is not for those who are not worthy or unable to receive it or would pervert it. And perhaps that's why there are methods like this in place, where the fruit has become forbidden. And according to the gods in Genesis, we're not to know the difference between right and wrong, we're to be told what the differences are between right and wrong. But that plan, according to the story, was spoiled when someone ate something that opened their eyes. Now was it really an apple? We know that the apple is symbolic of something. We encourage children to eat apples. Perhaps the apple is a symbol for the actual forbidden fruit. On the left is an apple, and on the right is the Amanita muscaria mushroom, here with a bite taken out of each. It's a perfect symbol. In the Song of Solomon, Solomon's lover describes him as an apple tree among the trees of the forest. In my book, I show the connections between the Amanita muscaria mushroom, Addis, Adamus, Tammuz, and the rest. When you read that chapter, you'll better understand this connection. The Song of Solomon is said to be the sacred marriage liturgy from a Mesopotamian ritual of marriage between two gods, Tammuz and Astarte. So, in this interpretation of the legend, Astarte describes her lover, Solomon, Tammuz, Addis, as its true character, the mushroom, the sacred flesh of the pine tree god, the Amanita muscaria, an apple tree among the trees of the forest. If you were going into the forest, looking for the Amanita muscaria, but that's not what you were told you were looking for because, oh, it hasn't been given that name yet. You might be told to go into the forest and look for apples to find the apple tree. The result would be the same. You would find what you were looking for, an apple among the trees of the forest. The ancient Greeks and the early pagans used sacred plants as a way to communicate with the gods. In fact, this is very well established. So what happened with Christianity? This is St. Michael's Church in Hildesheim, Germany. Notice the ceiling. The word church comes from the name of the goddess Circe, the patroness of divine inebriation. In theory, we're led to understand that the scriptures lead the adherents back to the garden and the tree of life and into the presence of the divine. In reality, only the correct interpretation of the scriptures will lead one back to the real tree of life and its fruit. But now we're on a literal treasure hunt. This ceiling where these two are eating the Amanita muscaria mushroom, is not flat. These 
orbs that they're eating are actually raised bumps in the ceiling. Images of Jesus with mushrooms and images of Adam and Eve with mushrooms are quite common if you look for these things. And here it's pretty difficult to see on the left, but if you just let your eyes adjust for a second, you will see the distinct shape of the Liberty Cap mushroom. The vertical striations, the little ring at the top. So I'd like to change gears here for just a second and finish up the astrotheology portion of this talk on the origin of the world. It's better to know the difference between good and evil when you see it than to be told which is which and then trust that you aren't being manipulated. The gods of Genesis wanted to control the sacred plants in the garden while this Lucifer character, whoever he was, was saying, take and eat. Now notice in this picture, it is a serpent that is giving Eve the forbidden fruit. But according to the story, it wasn't a serpent that tempted Eve with the apple. Crawling on his belly was punishment for telling man to take and eat. So if it wasn't a serpent that tempted Eve with the forbidden fruit, who was it? And the Lord said, Behold, the man has become as one of us, to know good and evil. And the gods were worried that man was going to eat from the tree of life and live forever. And for that, they were banished from the garden. From a perspective of creation, why would you make a food that would give humans the knowledge of good and evil and then make it forbidden? Is that what Jesus would do? I am the living bread that came down from heaven. If anyone eats this bread, he will live forever. It doesn't seem like the gods in the book of Genesis and Jesus were on the same page. We're told to believe that Jesus died on a cross so that everyone in the world could have access to the very thing that the Lord God in the book of Genesis had made forbidden. So who were these gods? This Lord and Jesus obviously both have opposite agendas. Given what we know about this forbidden fruit, if Jesus had walked into the Garden of Eden, he would have also told Eve to eat the forbidden fruit. Perhaps it was Jesus in the Garden of Eden, opening the eyes of Adam and Eve. This is the Gnostic belief. This is a Gnostic coin, a 16th century coin with a crucified Jesus on one side and a crucified Lucifer on the other. Moses, Lucifer, Jesus, all three had the same message, take and eat. Whether it was manna, the forbidden fruit, or the bread of life, the message was the same. And I'm very specific to use the word Lucifer instead of Satan or the devil. Because I will say that Jesus and Lucifer are one and the same character. But I'm not suggesting that Jesus is Satan. And I'm not saying that the devil is the son of God. I'm fascinated by any myth, legend, or lore that somehow strikes fear into the hearts of completely rational people. Doctors, lawyers, police officers, Ivy League graduates, even members of Mensa. So many believers would never question the identity of Lucifer because they believe the Bible was written by the mind of God and the hand of man. Divine Inspiration as I've mentioned, to question the authors of this sacred text is to doubt the perfect mind of God. The phrase, never underestimate the power of faith, is very true. Faith is tied directly to your ego, and when these two forces get together, they can control your life. Your ego tells your mind that your faith is strong while your mind is questioning everything, using logic and reason to rationalize these bizarre religious claims. 
Over time, logic and reason surrender, and these important questions fade away as you cultivate a literal belief in deities such as the demonic Lucifer. Before we go any further, I'd like to make a list of every chapter and verse in the Bible where Lucifer is mentioned. Isaiah 14, verse 12. How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou cut to the ground, which didst weaken the nations? That's it. Isaiah 14:12 is the only place in the Bible where the word Lucifer can be found. Yet this Lucifer is somehow synonymous with the devil, Satan, the detested angel, the Lord of Flies, Little Horn, Beelzebub, the Prince of Darkness, and all of the others. Yet the Catholic Encyclopedia states, the fathers of the church maintain that Lucifer is not a proper name of the devil. Actually, in some translations, Lucifer, like Christ, is intended to be a title, not a proper name at all. According to most scholars, the Lucifer in the Bible is intended to represent King Nebuchadnezzar and not a fallen angel from heaven. When dissected down to its etymological roots, the word Lucifer is said to mean light bringer. From Latin, lux meaning light and fairy meaning to carry, bring, or bear. And if you're paying close attention, you will notice that Lucifer is a Latin name which found its way into a divinely inspired Hebrew manuscript that was said to be written long before a Latin language existed. The truth of the matter is, the editors of the Bible read that this Lucifer had fallen from heaven and they either decided to include it into their mythology or they simply made a mistake. Consider the symbol of the encircled pentagram. The pentagram is often said to represent Baphomet and Lucifer, but this same symbol has often been symbolic of love, fellowship, human intelligence, faith, and sexuality. It is a symbol of the goddess Venus. In fact, it is the astronomical and astrological representation of the rotating cycle of the planet Venus and its path through the heavens. Venus is the actual morning star. In view of the fact that Venus is extremely close to the Sun, its rotation never moves it very far away from the Sun from our perspective here on Earth. As we rotate, it either rises on our horizon just before the Sun, or if it's on the other side of the Sun from our perspective, it follows the Sun down after sunset. Consequently, it is the morning star, and it is often the evening star. When viewed from Earth, successive inferior conjunctions of the planet Venus plot a nearly perfect pentagram around the zodiac roughly every eight years. One would see a pentagram by picking any sunrise date on which the morning star is prominent and then repeating this observation at 584 day intervals following that date for eight years. All of these things are left out of our common teaching while the symbol itself is demonized, just as are the deities connected with these symbols. Because most Christians openly claim deities such as Lucifer, Beelzebub, and Satan are all the same entity, confusion is plentiful. Essentially, all secular gods were demonized and thrown into the fires of hell where they melted into one deity. There has always been a difference between Beelzebub, Lucifer, Satan, and the others. However, these variations became buried beneath Christianity's mountain of disinformation and misinformation. Rather than climbing this mountain to get a clear point of view, so many people instead bow down before it in worship and prayer. For them, the unknown is a gateway to hell. Fear of the unknown can build immeasurable mental boundaries as fear will almost always triumph over truth. If fear dominates truth, then fear hides the truth. To occult something is to hide something. In reality, fear of the unknown literally manufactures the occult. To say that you study the occult is simply to say that you study things that are hidden from plain view. 
Lucifer would make a fantastic talisman for the occult because, as I will explain, Christianity's Lucifer is the bringer of light, veiled in the guise of a spirit of darkness, a personification of the very word occult. The results of a web search for Lucifer worship will display hatred and finger-pointing, much of which comes from pro-Christian and or anti-Freemasonic websites. To quote one of these websites, If people really understood that Masonry was the worship of Satan, no one would join. Now this was said after the setup of Satan did this and Satan said that. Then they make the familiar leap from Satan to Lucifer. A taste of their own medicine would be something like this. If people were told that Christians partake in rites of passage where they light candles, chant in Latin, and participate in mock blood-drinking rituals, no one would join. Fear and propaganda steer people away from an understanding that could change the way they see the world forever. Furthermore, fear keeps people from an understanding that would demand a change in the way they live their lives. For some, it is the fear of change itself that keeps them from seeking the truth. And by the way, this secret Masonic order known by some as the Palladium or the Palladian Rite said to practice devil worship does not exist. It is and always has been a hoax. The Christian point of view may shed some light on both Lucifer and Jesus. Jesus is a deity who demands faith. Lucifer is a deity who demands proof. This sparks the age-old conflict between science, proof, and religion, faith. If the Christian concept of Lucifer is the same as Satan, then it must have been Lucifer in the Garden of Eden telling Adam and Eve to eat the forbidden fruit, thus encouraging them to open their eyes and know the difference between good and evil for themselves. Similarly, Lucifer is also Prometheus, a friend of mankind who stole fire from the gods and gave it to us mortals, quite literally the bringer of light and reminiscent of the Olympic torchbearer running toward humankind with fire stolen from the gods. Has Lucifer become an amalgamated mythological deity who was unjustly cast out of heaven, guilty of working to free humankind from ignorance? Perhaps. After all, considering the tale of Prometheus, something other than fire was stolen from the gods and given to humankind in the Garden of Eden. Knowledge, also known as light. Was the sin in the Garden of Eden the fact that Adam and Eve ate from a tree they were told not to eat from? Or was their sin the fact that they ate from the tree of knowledge? I won't get into the further details connecting Venus to Lucifer except to link them together as so. The snake in the Garden of Eden is Satan. Satan is seen as Lucifer. Lucifer is Venus. Venus is Aphrodite. Aphrodite is symbolic of sex, and sexual suppression has been at the top of this religion's agenda for millennia. In Islam, the word Shahatan means God's adversary. It's the root of the English word for Satan. It's been suggested that the church chose an Islamic word for such a contemptible deity because they considered the Islamic language itself to be dirty. For the modern day Satan worshiper, Satan represents the opposite of the Christian church and some of their elaborate rituals blatantly mock Christianity. Thus, the incorporation of stylized Christian symbols, unusual masks, and extravagant rituals. Satan or Lucifer, whatever the title, this deity is a sponge absorbing everything secular and taking the fall for every catastrophe and misfortune the church and humankind have ever experienced. Evolution and maintaining the status quo do not make good bedfellows. To maintain the status quo, you must shut down new ideas. New ways of thinking are always met with force in the beginning. So according to the story, Jesus was gone. He fell off the map for 18 years, missing from age 12 
to age 30. Many people suspect that he went to India, where there is a strong focus on philosophy, and there is a strong connection to mind-altering plants and mushrooms. Wherever he went, he returned with a philosophy and shamanic knowledge that none of his friends had ever witnessed. Having an in-depth knowledge of plants, especially psychedelic plants, is an obvious trait of a shaman. But it wouldn't be common knowledge for those living within the luxuries of Rome or even Nazareth. And this perhaps is one reason why Jesus would choose to speak in parables and never directly speak about his methods. He gave his disciples something to eat and drink, but he never said what it was. Whatever it was, it changed their lives forever. One of the first things Jesus says in the book of John is, Very truly I tell you, you will see heaven open and the angels of God ascend and descend upon the Son of Man. Any psychonaut worth his salt will tell you a strong psychedelic trip, especially outdoors, almost always feels like the sky is opening up, allowing you to peer into the heavens. Communing with something more than oneself. It can be a wonderful feeling that includes whatever words you want to use. Spirits, angels, Jesus, God. This kind of knowledge is not something that you would want to share with Rome. And again, this is the reason why Jesus would speak in parables. To keep him out of trouble. These degrees of separation were also applied to shamanism as a way to conceal the truth and protect the identity of either the shaman and or the recipe. And it should be obvious where I'm going with this. The true identity of the divine holy sacrament has been stolen and hidden from the people for over 2,000 years now. And then you get to today where the masses get a placebo. The shaman truly believes that when it comes to sacred plants, you are what you eat. The shaman becomes the mushroom. They take and eat. This is my body. This is who I am. And it really starts to make a lot more sense than anything to do with cannibalism. Speaking symbolically during the sacred meal, during the ritual itself, helped to conceal the true nature of the substance for over 2,000 years. The suggestion that Jesus was a shaman and a hierophant may sound like blasphemy, but in my mind it's quite fitting. His parables were not only taken to be offensive, but they were taken quite literally. And this is the moment in our history when the true nature of the mushroom was hijacked. It doesn't take much to put this puzzle together once you have all of the pieces. But the artists remembered the truth. The artists knew. The artists had a way of communicating with us living in the future. This is a fresco in a monastery in Greece. This is the Dormition of the Virgin. It's kind of difficult to see in the two pictures on the left, but there are little concentric rings, as if to show growth spurts. Those concentric rings aren't always difficult to see. Here is a basilica in Brazil. Notice the concentric rings showing the growth spurts. It looks as if Jesus is crucified on the mushroom. Artists tried desperately to hide the truth in their artwork. The artists who painted this fresco in central France were fleeing from the Crusades, and they hid their knowledge this way. 
I know this to be true because I interviewed the groundskeeper who has been living on this property for generations. They made these paintings as a way to preserve their knowledge. And the people who were chasing and trying to kill these people, they didn't know that they should also destroy the artwork. Because a picture says a thousand words, but a symbol, a symbol tells the whole story. Now, today the church claims direct access to God. And if you want to connect with God, then well, you better go to church. They've redefined the identity of Jesus Christ, and they've held these two true identities, yes, identities of Jesus, be it the sun, the plant, the man, they've held these identities hostage for some 2,000 years now. History, they've held history hostage, and in the end, history was almost lost. The most important part of the Eleusinian Mysteries was the ingestion of the Kikion, or the Kaikion. Psychedelic plants have been used in initiations for as long as there have been initiations and rituals. And Roman emperors, Cicero, Socrates, Plato, Aristotle, all of the greats participated in these mysteries. They're deeply rooted in human history. Yet today, they're taboo. This went on for over a thousand years. The actual sacrament would soon be replaced with a wafer and faith. There is always a history beyond the tradition and the ritual. Like the rest of Christianity, Easter is not just about astrotheology. And it's not just about shamanism. Again, there is always a history beyond the ritual and the tradition. You know, even though this mushroom is bright red, it's not always easy to find. And even when they're easy to find, they're not always easy to get to. It would make sense to task the children with collecting the mushrooms. Bring us back the correct mushrooms and you'll get a treat. And there's no doubt that these mushrooms look like little colored Easter eggs, sometimes even inside of their own nest. This is worn mostly by the cardinals in the church. Now a cardinal is a red bird. The phoenix is a red bird. A fire bird. The phoenix is in fact symbolic of the Amanita muscaria. The phoenix is born from its own ashes and will never live to leave its nest. For as it lifts its wings and attempts to fly, it bursts into flames and engulfs itself, leaving nothing behind but its own ashes. And the cycle continues. This is the cycle of the mushroom. It's born from the spores, its own ashes, and it will never leave its nest because when it lifts its wings as it seems to appear to fly, it bursts into flames and engulfs itself. It leaves nothing behind but its own ashes and the cycle continues. It leaves its spores behind in what appears to be a bird's nest and the cycle continues right here from this same nest. Especially when it comes to alchemy, we see that there are two waters. We see these boys peeing into the fountains quite often, and we learn there are two waters. The shield that this man is holding says out of two waters is one creation. Here is Mount Helicon, another alchemical image. And if we take a closer look, the entire mountain or hill looks a lot like a mushroom to me. And at the very top, of course, we see the sacred tree and two different kinds of water coming out of the fountain. I'll break this down right now and show you exactly why these two different kinds of water 
this whole thing with urine is significant. So how does this mushroom turn from bright red to gold? Well this happens when it dries and this is a it's a deep carboxylation process. As I said before the ibotenic acid in the mushroom, the part that gives you the sweats and kind of makes you sick, more or less evaporates and in doing so the musimol, the active ingredient, the psychedelic property, intensifies. And when you eat this mushroom and it hits your liver, it will decarboxylize even further. And this makes the mushroom even more potent. But it's too late, you've already eaten it. But not really, because the active ingredient, the musimol in this mushroom, will be excreted in your urine, making your urine even more potent than the mushroom itself. The shaman in Siberia knew this. They used to drink the urine of the reindeer and vice versa. The reindeer would come running over anytime they saw yellow snow. And we even find some clues in the Bible, like drink water from your own cistern, running water from your own well. And we see Jesus again speaking in parables saying that if anybody thirsts, let him come to me and drink. Out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. Out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. And Jesus reluctantly converted water into wine at the wedding. This was his first miracle. And we know that all wine was mixed wine. There was a wine purification act and it was quite recent compared to this ancient history where you couldn't just go putting anything you want in the wine anymore. But back then, herbs, botanicals, psychedelics, they were all infused into the wine and still considered wine. And 2,000 years later, we hear that he converted water into wine and think that it was some sort of a miracle. Here's something else that I learned from my friend Clark Heinrich. This is Titan's Bacchanal of the Andreans. And if we notice here in the close-up, here is the little boy, the humunculus. And we know this is a river of wine because this man here is scooping some up in a pitcher and everyone is drinking it and having a festival. And then there's this old man laying naked in the flowers on the top of the hill. Perhaps he's the shaman who orchestrated this entire gathering. And perhaps he's taken a higher dose of the wine than everyone else has. And right in the middle of the painting is a sheet of music. And if you were to see the painting itself, you would see what this sheet of music says. It says, he who drinks and does not drink again does not know what drinking is. So just to return for a moment to this alchemical image as a reminder of the two waters. From the two waters, one creation. And if you were to go to the Vatican, you would see these two waters. Two giant water fountains, each looking quite a bit like the Amanita muscaria mushroom. It even has little bumps across the mushroom cap. But it really should be no surprise because these types of things were common back then. It really only seems weird to us because we've eliminated all of these things from our society. Drugs were used to a wide extent in the Greek world. Even in the Greek assembly, they're equivalent of a congress. Yep, there's the Parthenon. This is where the world's first democracy was born. Amazing, right here. Right here, where we're standing. And the meetings would start with purification ritual, with the burning of incense, uh, botanical substances. The assembly members were subjected to a fumigation of psychotropic botanicals in order to induce what they called a jovial spirit so that they could then discuss politics. What was incense back then? We know they burnt frankincense and myrrh, plant resins, maybe plant leaves. Perhaps cannabis? 
It's not impossible. Yeah. The Greeks knew about cannabis. Well, let me give you a little hint, okay? Where there's incense, there's cannabis. Okay. <laughs> Fumigation is very much like hot boxing. So with hot boxing, you can sit in a car with uh, your buddies and smoke uh, marijuana, and you get the effects of the marijuana uh, continuously. Imagine filling the car with so much smoke that you were gasping. So it's the equivalent of taking our Congress and forcing them to uh, inhale psychotropic drugs before they actually met to discuss legislation. It seems like an elevated state was an important part of both religious uh, ceremonies, political ceremonies. It was an important part of Greek life. Well, that, that's true. Yeah. Um, intoxication was something that they thought important. This is the caduceus. This is my favorite symbol. It's held by Mercury. Mercury is the messenger of the gods. But following this archetype, who else was the messenger of the gods? Jesus Christ was manna. Jesus Christ was manna. The burning bush was a messenger of God. Pillars of smoke, the Eucharist, entheogens. And we know that the words merchant and mercury have the same etymological roots. And in the courtroom there is the mace, which is a symbol of authority, which looks a lot like the caduceus. The kundalini, the chakra system, energy work, and things like this. It's not really my thing, but that is where the symbolism will take you if you follow it in that direction. If you follow it in the direction of religion, you'll see Moses putting a serpent on the staff. You'll see Adam and Eve standing on either side of a tree with a serpent wrapped around it, looking quite a bit like the caduceus. And of, and of course, the messenger of the God says here, take and eat. This apple won't kill you. It's going to open your eyes. Here's a symbol that I put in my book. This is the Egyptian winged sun disk. If you imagine yourself standing above a caduceus or below a caduceus, as above, so below, this symbol. The winged sun disk is the caduceus viewed from the perspective of Hermes and Mercury holding the symbol itself. This is how you would see the caduceus if you looked up, just like you were holding an umbrella. And what do we do to our Christmas tree? this staff that we bring into our house. We put wings at the top of it and we wrap ribbon or tinsel around it, forming the caduceus in our living room. From the perspective of occult anatomy, the staff is the spinal column and the wings are associated with and represent the ventricular system of the brain. Now they used to call it a drugstore. Now the Doctors call it a pharmacy. They're going to send you to the pharmacy. But this is the symbol for the pharmacy, the Rx, Rho Chi. In Latin, it's an abbreviation for recipe. You look this up in Strong's Concordance, skip over to 5331 of the Greek Dictionary, and you'll see that pharmakia means sorcery and witchcraft. Well, pharmakia this is the pharmacy where we buy our medications today. This isn't sorcery or witchcraft. This is necessary for our survival. And very similar to the Rho Chi is the Cairo. The Cairo is a monogram and a symbol for Christ. It consists of the superimposed letters X and P. Okay, well, X and P. We know that R and P are interchangeable in Greek. The R is a P and the P is the R. So the Chi Rho and the Rho Chi are actually the same symbol. So this becomes an interchangeable symbol for both the drug recipe and the deity. All you have to do with the symbol of Jesus, the Chi Rho, is slide that X over just a little bit and it becomes the Rokai, the symbol for drugs. 
And that's what I've been saying all along, is Jesus is representing himself as the drugs themselves. And the same goes with Christ. Did they just use any old oil they could get? Or was this oil special in some way? Was it special because it was expensive and difficult to find? Or was it special because something happened when you were anointed with this stuff? The oil is very similar to the wine in that they were both mixed with different herbs and botanicals and still labeled one thing. They call it wine, but it could be anything, psychedelic or just an alcohol. The oil could be oil that you cook with, or it could be something that you anoint with. But to suggest that they're both made from the same ingredients is ignorant, to say the least. My friend Chris Bennett wrote this in his book, and I think I should read this because it really puts things into perspective. The Greek title Christ is the translation of the Hebrew word Messiah, which in English becomes the anointed. The Messiah was recognized as such by his being anointed with the holy anointing oil. If Jesus was not initiated in this fashion, then he was not the Christ and he had no official claim to the title. And it was a title. Christ means the anointed. If they were just using any oil they could get, why have a special title for those who were anointed with this sacred oil? I believe that this sacred oil was only traditionally used in their rituals. I think that a small circular cap was soaked in this sacred oil and placed on the freshly shaved heads of these elders. Freshly shaved with razor burn. They didn't have the razor blades that we have today. So this would be a very capillary rich area. And if psychedelic oils were placed in here, any psychedelic substance placed on this area would then be absorbed directly into the bloodstream. And the ring of hair around their head would prevent any of the oil from running down their face, into their eyes, down the back of their neck. There's always a history beyond the tradition and beyond the ritual. And this can be true about witches as well, especially the stereotypical traditions that we apply to witchcraft. These women didn't shave a ring of hair around their head. They were much more creative. Now, of course, the plants are green. Their ointment or their concoction is going to be green. And they're going to smear this all over their face and hands and that makes their skin look green and that's the green appearance of the witch uh, but why is she riding on the broom well because she's also been stirring her cauldron with this broom and she's going to put that broom handle in a very capillary rich area When you think of humans as part animal and part angel, the ascension up the ladder, ascending up the ladder into the heavens, represents an attempt to shed the animal body and become one with this divine creative force. God, the all, whatever you want to call it. This is why we see ladders in so many traditions. Now, sometimes it is a symbol for other things like the human spine. And again, this can be translated as the Kundalini energy force. And at the very top of the caduceus, at the very top of this energy force, is the head of the human being, with its ventricular system being the wings, or a nub that's at the top of this staff. And oftentimes this nub is a pine cone. It's interesting, a pine cone. Why would there be a pine cone at the top of this staff? Well, the pineal gland inside the brain is shaped like a pine cone, and that could be one reason. 
And again, we'll get to occult anatomy in just a moment. But the pine cone is the seed of the Amanita muscaria mushroom. You can't have the Amanita muscaria mushroom without the seed of a tree. You can't cultivate this mushroom. It must be found in nature. In the tablets relating the ancient tale known as the Epic of Gilgamesh, the pine cone is the plant of immortality. And this is a picture of me trying to steal it. The staff carried by the Pope incorporates a pine cone right there at eye level where the pineal gland would be. In the Vatican courtyard, you'll find the largest statue of a pine cone on the planet. The word pineal and the word pine cone have the same etymological DNA. Notice the peacocks on either side here. What's up with the peacocks? Well, the peacock represents an open chakra system. It's covered with these all-seeing eyes, its ability to see everything at once, to be a part of everything at once. Its chakra system is wide open. And we would see this symbol reflected in the shaman as he was ingesting sacred plants and his chakra system, his third eye was just blown wide open. And under the influence of, say, peyote, the chief's headdress becomes an obvious symbol for his illuminated chakra. So this has been symbolized all throughout antiquity as well, up to modern day. This is Pentecost. Pentecost is 49 days after the resurrection of Jesus. The Greek word that we translate as resurrect also means awaken. So anytime the word resurrection was written in ancient Greek, it also means to awaken. But remember that 49 days. And then we come to Buddhism, where Gautama meditates underneath the Bodhi tree for 49 days and then becomes the Buddha. And according to Buddhist tradition, when you die, you pass through what they call the bardo. Catholics may refer to this as purgatory, but this image is a depiction of the Buddhist bardo. And all of the gods that you must be judged by as you pass through the bardo. My point is to say that upon death, the Buddhists believe that there is a 49-day period as you pass through the bardo. Now in anatomy, 49 days after conception is the day in which the embryo becomes a fetus. The fingers and toes and eyes begin to develop. Oh, and so does the pineal gland. Now speaking of the pineal gland, let's talk about DMT or dimethyltryptamine. This is a very powerful psychedelic the prototype of its class, and it's chemically related to LSD. It exists both endogenous, inside our bodies, and exogenous, outside of our bodies. Actually, it can be found almost anywhere in nature where there is life. But it can especially be found within the cerebral spinal fluid of the human brain. So keep that in mind. Four LSD-like compounds exist in humans. This isn't new stuff, and I'm not making this up. This is from the Boston Globe, 1976-1978. The progression of this information can be found in a DVD called The Spirit Molecule, produced by Dr. Rick Strassman. One of the men that's frequently interviewed in this DVD is Dr. Dennis McKenna. I've also interviewed him several times for my films and my research. And during one of my interviews, I asked, Where is DMT found in nature? Um, 
Well, a better question would be where is where is it not found in nature? Um, I mean, this is this is really interesting to me. The fact that DMT is so ubiquitous in nature, um, and it it's it's part it, it is it is from the chemical standpoint structurally it's the simplest of the psychedelics it's a very very simple compound and and in terms of biochemistry it's only two steps away from tryptophan tryptophan is an amino acid it's one of the essential amino acids so it is universal all living things have tryptophan uh, now, not all living things have DMT, probably, but but the enzymes that convert tryptophan to DMT, there are two main enzymes in this process, are also universal. I mean, I don't know how chemical we want to get here, but the basic idea is that there's an enzyme that takes off the acid group of the amino acid so it turns it from an amino acid into an amine and then there's another uh, enzyme that puts uh, methyl groups onto the amine so you get first you get tryptophan and then you get tryptamine and then you get dimethyl tryptamine which is what DMT is and this goes on I think very commonly uh, well, these enzymes are certainly common. I mean, they're common in all cells, practically. Do all organisms contain DMT? I think it's possible that all organisms might contain traces of DMT. There are many plants that contain DMT. We know of at least a couple hundred, and that's only because we've looked. You know, there are probably thousands of plants. There are, in fact, my suspicion is that because tryptophan is so easily converted to DMT, I think if you went out with a sufficiently sensitive instrument, mass spectrometer or whatever, and just started sampling plants at random and shoving those through your gas chromatograph or whatever you're using, you would find traces of DMT in every plant. and. You would also find it, we know it's very widespread in animals too. So we know it's in amphibians, we know it's in mammals, including us. We know it's in marine organisms, we know it's in fish. So it's, yeah, it's, it's odd that, well, maybe it's not odd. It's just a fact of nature that it's all over the place. And, and probably is about as close to being universal as, as anything is. The staff is the spinal column, and the wings are associated with and represent the ventricular system of the brain. And these sacs are filled with cerebral spinal fluid that contains the extremely psychedelic substance DMT. DMT and 5-MeO-DMT can be found in the cerebral spinal fluid. This is well established. The cerebral spinal fluid is in blue here, surrounding and protecting the brain. Your brain is literally floating in DMT. Here's another image of the brain, and you can see the outline there of the ventricular system. Here I've made that a little bit more easy to see. And here you can kind of see where I'm going with the symbolism of this third eye DMT manufacturing facility within our brain. What a wonderful amalgamation of symbolism of this all-seeing eye. It truly sees inside of your person. And that's what the all-seeing eye truly is. Here is Odin. And you see that he has lost an eye. He has one eye covered. And so does Woden. Woden has Wotan. All the same character. But what is happening here is he has one eye that is looking inward and one eye that is looking outward into the world. So he has this all-seeing eye ability to see within himself 
and to navigate within the world. Santa Claus, the shaman, is also winking at you, as if he has a secret, and as if he is carrying this symbol, as with many other symbols, that parallels Odin. So it really doesn't matter who the character is, because it represents us. The only boundaries that exist in this world are boundaries that we have built with words. Because if you cut to the core of it and consider pantheism, language and description is really the only thing that truly exists. One way to utilize meditation and eliminate the sense of the self and the body is with an isolation tank. Because any time that you're sitting or even laying down to meditate, gravity is always going to imprison your consciousness within the confines of your body. And this is the very reason isolation tanks were invented. This gives you the ability to do what a shaman does and not just think outside the box, but think outside the body. Over half a ton of salt is added to the inside of this tank, and then it's filled with water up to a certain level, and that water is adjusted to body temperature. And the salt water solution is so dense that when you get inside, you don't touch the bottom of the tank. You begin to float. The tank door closes, and it closes out any source of light. Your ears are below the water, so all sound is blocked out. And regardless of the smell, your sense of smell is gone because the olfactory senses really only detect change in smell. So as long as nothing changes, you're not going to smell anything anyway. So this is a method of cutting off all sensory input to the body and just exploring the self. This is a method of preparing your mind for that state of crossing over when you die. This is preparation for death. I think this is very important. This is ego death. Because as your mental grocery list is being filled, and you go back and forth between trying to let go, trying to clear your mind, trying to let go, and then trying to clear your mind again. This process sorts out some of the subconscious issues that you may have never thought to take the time to deal with. You know, it sounds cliche, but it's like layers of an onion. It's too difficult for you to get to the core of yourself with all of those layers of distractions. So this is more of a method and a technique, something that you have to master. None of us are great at sex the first time we try, and none of us are going to be great at forcing an out-of-body experience the first time we try. These things take a little finesse. So this ego death really has nothing to do with being egotistical. These two fighters are about to go at it. You know, perhaps getting your ass kicked in front of millions of people is a form of ego death, but it isn't the ego that I'm trying to relate to here. I'm talking about the kind of ego death that's more of a sudden realization of pantheism. A sudden realization that you are a part of the all. We're all connected. That's what the little prodigy meant by there is no spoon. There is no you and there is no me. We're all a part of something greater than we can comprehend. That's why we spend all of our time describing everything that we see with language. As we experience life, we and our ancestors have, by nature, given a word for everything that we've discovered. In other words, we've given a word for every degree of separation from the all that we've ever found. No matter how large or small the mass is, whether it's a galaxy, a sun, the atom, a thought, we've given it a name.
There are two theories about how the world works, and each one depends on a fundamental assumption about what the world is. There's the scientific theory, which says the world is tiny packets of matter squealing along through empty space at close to the speed of light and subject to a certain set of interlocking laws. That's what science tells us the world is. Another theory is, and, and to my mind, a much more appealing and even intuitively correct theory, is the world is language. The world is made of language. We can say that the world is composed of little demons doing calisthenics, each one the size of a pissant's eyebrow. Or we can say the world is made out of wave mechanical packets of matter flying along at the speed of light. But notice that what we get each time is words. Our model of what the world is, is made of words, and the world is composed of description. Now, in the era before science, scientists like to say people were more epistemologically naive. What they mean by that is they didn't have a clear understanding of the division between the inside and the outside, between what we imagine and what actually is. But if you live long enough, I think you discover what we imagine and what actually is are very close to the same thing. Now, whenever you say the world is made of language, the positivists object by saying, well, then why isn't it the way we say it is? I didn't say it's the way we say it is. I said it's made of language. And uh, part of the inspiration for my career is the realization that you could get up in front of audiences and say how the world is and to a small degree, for a limited time, in a limited space, it shimmers and recasts itself and becomes the thing that we say that it is. The mind is somehow a co-creator in the process of reality through acts of language. And language is very, very mysterious. I mean, it is true magic. People run all over the place looking for paranormal abilities. But notice that when I speak, if your internal dictionary matches my internal dictionary, that my thoughts cross through the air as an acoustical pressure wave and are reconstructed inside your cerebral cortex as your thought, your understanding of my words. Telepathy exists. It's just that the carrier wave is small mouth noises. All so-called primitive people know that the world is made of language that you sing it into existence, that what you say it is, is what it is, that it is maintained in existence by an act of rational apprehension. And it's, it's only science which has taken this very weird approach and said, no, no, the, uh, the world is somehow independent from the act of description. And uh, this is not a situation where we have two separate points of view, both uh, open-hearted and, uh, and trying their best to, to work hard for you.
science carried out its analysis of nature to the point where it shot itself in the foot. Science carried out an analysis of nature that went to such depth that it discovered that nature doesn't exist except as an object of description. That there are no little objects winging their way through empty space. There is only a situation describable by a multi-level fishy formula and when you drop a mind into that situation, the fishy formula can dance out into a little particle which can be measured. Mind is necessary for the world to undergo the formality of existing. This is what quantum physics teaches. Unfortunately, this news has not reached the other sciences. This is a, a, a real failure on the part of science. You see, throughout the 19th century, physics was the paradigmatic science. It was the science everybody envied. It's not unusual in physics for theory and experiment to be congruent to three decimal points of accuracy. That just causes scientists to go uh, wild. They love that when theory and measurement fall into congruency like that. And so everyone wanted to be like, like physics. Chemistry sought that. Sociology, psychology, biology. Meanwhile, physics, pursuing the exploration of matter, broke through to a domain where matter ceased to be definable, ceased to even exist in any ordinary way, seemed to behave in incredibly strange ways. Time flows backward, energy crosses barriers without ever going through them, by tunneling through them in some way. Modern biology is still afflicted with physics envy. Meanwhile, physics has gone on to a realm of such exotic and surreal uncertainty that it's at this point to the left of psychology in the precision of its metaphors. So the science has undercut itself and now exists in a state of unrecognized crisis that hopefully uh, the psychedelic experience will exacerbate to the point where this will arrive on the plate of every experimentalist and an observer of nature. So the universe isn't made of stuff. It's made of language. So the world is made of language and life is but a dream. A dream with an amazing celestial story and mushrooms everywhere you look, if you know where to look.